All right, it's uh, 5 p.m. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this the Skeletal Dynamics Elbow webinar. Today, we will talk about how the radial head works, fails, how to fix it, and how to replace it. I want to introduce our panelists today, Dr. Orbe from the Miami Bone and Joint Institute, and Dr. Ariza from the Dallas Orthopedic Institute. Um, with that, I'm going to give the word to Dr. Orbe. Thank you, Jose. Let me share the screen. Can, can you uh, allow me to share? Thank you. So my, my part here is going to speak about how the radial head works and how the radial head fails. Let's see. So the radial head is really part of the proximal condyle of the forearm joint. And the forearm joint has two condyles, the proximal and the distal radial ulnar joint and it's connected by one axis of rotation. This joint is uh, controlled by the forearm interosseous ligament, uh, which is in, um, the ligament is an isometric structure. It has basically three bands, and these bands either originate or insert on the bone surface where the axis of forearm rotation is in, um, is on the axis of rotation. The <clears throat> ligament basically guides the motion of the radius around the ulna. The radial head is a primary mechanical restraint to axial load on the radius. And is also the main bony support to valgus loads. There's, what's very important about the radial head is that it is uh, it prevents posterior medial rotatory instability. So if we have a loss of the radial head and a loss of the lateral supporting structures, the forearm tends to dislocate posteriorly and rotate into uh, supination as it dislocates. What creates uh, the injury to the radial head? So usually a, a, a an axial load, this axial load uh, can be um, <clears throat> uh, moderate in intensity or very severe, and it will produce different injuries. A moderate load might simply create a radial head fracture with no other component to it. And these are the simple radial heads with no dislocation that we treat because of the mechanical uh, uh, importance of having a congruent proximal radial ulnar joint and a radiocapitellar joint. But many of these radial head fractures come associated to other injuries, and most of them have an axial component too. For example, the Montilla uh, fracture dislocation is in the result of an axial force. The type Two Montijas, when they're uh, distal to the coronoid process, or what um, is uh, has been uh, introduced by O'Driscoll and his team as a trans ulnar Montija fracture dislocation, these injuries tend to have a slight uh, posterior direction, and they create a shear fracture in which the distal fragment dislocates posteriorly and the radial head uh, fails. This is a typical type two uh, Montilla with a radial head fracture. When the axial load is in a more uh, coaxial direction with the forearm, then the injury tends to be different. It tends to involve the coronoid and the radial head, and these are usually the terrible triads. 
when the impact is more in an anterior direction, then we get the basal coronoid transulnar fracture dislocations, according to the new O'Driscoll classification. But what these really uh, are, to understand them, they are a type of pilon injury of the uh, elbow in which the force has an anterior direction and produces this explosion type of fracture of the ulna with a radial head fracture. And this is a typical um, <clears throat> uh, basic, basal coronoid uh, trans ulnar fracture dislocation. The, the, the names of these injuries have, have been very confusing through the years. Um, some of these have been called uh, transolacral fracture dislocations. Those are due to a more uh, perpendicular force to the uh, elbow. And in these injuries, there usually is um, an intact radio uh, ulnar joint. It's basically the dislocation occurs through the olecranon. So we don't consider them here. But lastly, there is one uh, very important radial head fracture that we must be aware of. It's the very high energy injury uh, that produces the SX low presti fracture dislocation. There is so much energy involved here that not only does the radial head fracture, but the central band of the interosseous ligament fails, and then the whole forearm uh, uh, basically uh, collapses. The radius uh, foreshortens on the ulna. And this is a typical um, SX low presti injury in which we have a distal uh, radial ulnar joint axial dislocation plus a radial head fracture. Mason classified the, the, uh, the anatomy of the uh, radial head fracture in three types, types A, B, and C. A are, uh, and the, the D fracture was added by the Mayo group. The D fracture is any type of radial head fracture associated to a dislocation. The type A are basically very low energy injuries in which there is a non-displaced fracture, usually a shear type of a, a partial articular fracture. And these are usually treated simply by early motion. We see many of these every Monday morning in our, in our uh, clinic, and we start them just on early uh, motion to prevent them from developing a flexion contracture of the elbow. Type uh, B fractures, Mason type B, are the ones that have a, a partial articular injury. It's a shear type of fracture. The fracture plane is uh, parallel to the form, and these can be treated conservatively, uh, provided they um, don't have a blocked motion uh, with reasonable good results. But when there is a blocked to, mo to motion, then these often need internal fixation. They're relatively easy to treat. The uh, Exposure is done through a ligament uh, preserving approach, a coker or a coker modification. I'm sorry, a Kaplan or a Kaplan modification. So we prefer preserve the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And these are treated uh, by screw fixation. Type C fractures are the complete articular types. These uh, uh, usually uh, present comminution of the Ahead also, there are some type Cs that are simply a neck fracture, but they're the, the minority of them. Most type C fractures have a split that basically fragments the head in two, and one of the uh, halves of the head is again fractured in two pieces. So they usually present three articular fractures, uh, uh, fragments. They can be treated with excision. This is a time-tested method. Uh, but it has its uh, uh, it has its advantages. It's simple. It's inexpensive, and it has in a disadvantage is that it really exacerbates elbow instability. You can live without a radial head, provided you have uh, good collateral uh, ligament, but you don't have a normal elbow. Many of these patients uh, lose motion. They lose uh, forearm rotation. They can also lose some flexion and extension. They certainly have weakness to strength testing, especially in pronosupination, but also in elbow uh, flexion or extension. 
With time, many of these patients develop a positive ulnar variance with pain at the distal radial ulnar joint, a form of axial collapse that develops uh, insidiously and slowly. And in this uh, uh, case, you can see there is an, a um, cyst in the lunate. And very commonly, these patients without a radial head will develop osteoarthritis of the elbow down um, many years. It takes up usually 15 or 20 years for them to develop osteoarthritis, which tends not to be very symptomatic and seldom requires treatment, but they certainly don't have a normal elbow. And why do they develop this osteoarthritis? Is because without the support of the radial head, which usually transfers about 50% of the load down the radius, the ulnohumeral notch is uh, loaded abnormally uh, in a uh, torsional uh, rotational manner, which it doesn't tolerate very well. Type C fractures can be treated not only by excision, but also by internal fixation, but not all cases can be. Those cases in which the fragments are not very displaced and they're still attached to soft tissue, like uh, this patient can be treated with plate fixation. It is important to apply the plates correctly in the safe zone. The safe zone is that 100 degree arc of the radial head that never comes in contact with the sigmoid notch. And the way to clinically determine where is the uh, safe zone, we can say that it is perpendicular to the plane of the forearms, perhaps 30 degrees in, in, uh, towards the thumb. So anywhere between the Lister tubercle and the styloid process of the radius is um, that could be considered to be the arc of the safe zone. So if you place your, your, your plates or your hardware fixation in this area, you will never uh, impinge on the uh, proximal radial ulnar joint. It's important, so important also that the plates be of low profile because if they are very prominent, they will irritate the annular ligament and uh, the soft tissue around the elbow joint. This can be quite disturbing. So it's important to have uh, um, very low uh, profile plates. And our group put a lot of effort in designing uh, plates that were uh, truly anatomic, low profile, but all patients are different. Nothing fits everybody perfect. So the plates have to also be malleable. And we uh, have um, developed this uh, technology that allows us to basically bend the plates inside to utilizing these uh, pliers, special pliers that allow us to fit them to the variable anatomy of the proximal radius. Some, in some cases, uh, you can try to be heroic, but if you find yourself fixing your radial head on the table, we call this the green towel sign, that means it's probably time to stop and consider something else. Uh, when we look at the literature, those cases in which um, type three radial heads that have been treated by internal fixation have a high failure rate, approximately 50% failure rate. And that is due to a vascular necrosis as these fragments have no circulation and non-union. That's where radial head replacement comes in. It's an easy and reproducible method, but it has had historically difficulties with problems such as loosening of the uh, stem, capitellar erosion. And in the first uh, or second year after surgery, about 25% of these implants have been removed. And this is certainly um, not a good track record. The problem is that we have been improving the results with radial head replacement. Uh, originally, the radial head replacement was considered a spacer, just simply a piece of material preventing the radius from collapsing. But now more recently, I think we're starting to understand that the radial head should be a hemiarthroplasty. It should be able to withstand the physiological loads seen by the uh, uh, human radial head. And I'm going to show you one example, the patient treated with a radial head replacement. This is an SX lopresti on a 33-year-old male that presents the typical squashed head uh, appearance. The radial head fractures associated to SX lopresti often have this 
uh, a different uh, radiographic appearance. The clinical presentation also is different from a radial head fracture. These patients have pain from the wrist to the elbow. They have pain along the forearm. They have, they're massively swollen. Whenever we see a radial head fracture, we should always take an x-ray of the wrist. And that x-ray of the wrist can show that there is a positive ulnar variance. And that should make us suspect the possibility of an SX loprestie lesion. It is confirmed one very good way of doing so is fluoroscopically in the operating room prior to fixing or replacing the radial head, simply by axially uh, compressing the radius on the fluoroscope, we can see that there is a uh, prominence of the radial head. Another way is to pull on the uh, proximal stump of the radius with a clamp under the fluoroscope. In this case, we have uh, this is uh, a, a lateral uh, approach, a lateral uh, ligament preserving approach as a patient has not had a, an elbow dislocation. And we measure the radial head. And we have found that simply radial head replacement in SX loprestie does not work. You have to address the problem with the uh, interosseous ligament, the central band of the interosseous ligament. It can be repaired or reconstructed. Uh, in the past, we used to use allograft. Now we're using uh, suture construct, um, uh, a tightrope type of uh, device in um, the acute cases. The, uh, the, the chronic cases always require, besides the suture construct, they also require an allograft tendon. But this is an acute case. Uh, so we are, and before the advent of the uh, of, of the uh, suture construct, we simply use a nice uh, 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 long piece of allograft. This is um, a semitendinosus, and it's applied proximally with a, a, a an interference screw to the um, radius. We made it a drill hole through the radius, a drill hole through the ulna. The radial drill hole is just proximal to the insertion of the pronator terrace. That's where anatomically the central band inserts. And distally, the tunnel is made about five to seven centimeters proximal to the uh, distal, uh, to the ulnar head. And that's where the anatomical origin of the uh, central band is located. Uh, once the, it's, it's fixed to the radius, we pull as hard as we can to lift the radius back up into place and then fix it with another interference screw. Once the radius has been returned to its uh, length, then that's when we cut the radial stump. And it's important to do it in this stage because the what we have to do is create a radial head that does not push the radius up, but just maintains uh, and protects the interosseous uh, ligament. So we cut to the minimal uh, length required, and then we confirm after cutting that we have achieved the correct uh, cut. Then we ream for the radial head replacement. And it's important uh, to remember that we should always ream with a forearm in pronation because in supination, a straight reamer tends to interfere with the lateral uh, humeral condyle, uh, but in full uh, pronation, it's the direction of the reaming is very favorable. The radial head should be uh, now measured to perfectly fill the space created but not to be overstuffed and one way to do it if you if you have enough uh, instability in, in the elbow joint you just simply uh, take a look at the corner between the lesser and the greater sigmoid notch and confirm that the proximal surface of your radial head is just that level but this is seldom not possible with a, a, a an SX loprestie injury with or so, some of the less unstable elbow uh, injuries. And here we have to assess our length radiographically. The way to do so, this is the trial implant, is to make sure that the implant, uh, when we place the forearm flat on the, on, on the uh, examinant table, and we shoot the, uh, uh, the fluoroscopic beam, we have to make sure that the uh, head is perfectly in profile, so you're seeing a flat surface uh, of the uh, proximal surface of the radial head. 
you then make sure that that flat surface is right at that corner between both lesser and greater sigmoid notches. And the radial head we use is the one that we align to the axis of forearm rotation. There's a guide that allows you to do that. And it's important now to uh, set the radial head permanently by uh, inducing um, six, at least 60 inch pounds that is measured by this minimal torque indicating gauge. Because this is a relative, relatively high torque, we must give counter uh, traction to the, um, to the guide with one hand as we crank on the screw with the other hand. And the goal of uh, SXR Presti reconstruction is to have a uh, properly uh, uh, sized radial head that will achieve a level wrist at the end. And that we've reconstructed the uh, radial head in the axis of the forearm rotation to prevent capitellar wear. And we have a nice interosseous ligament uh, reconstruction that is uh, holding the radius to length and avoiding all the forces to be applied through the radial head. And last but not least, we're all the way distal, so why not repair the triangular fiber cartilage if it's repairable? Now, in this particular patient who happened to be a uh, gym, a, a, a high school gym instructor, at one year he had a level wrist and he had recovered uh, basically full function of his upper extremity. So why have we uh, designed a radial head with such a degree of complexity? Because we must understand how the radial head works. So the about 90% of the force that your hand produces during uh, any activity are applied to the distal radius. The great majority is applied to the radius, only a small percentage is applied to the ulna. That force comes down the radius, but then it's then transmitted from the radius to the ulna by the interosseous ligament that is placed around 21 degrees from, uh, uh, from uh, longitudinal. Uh, in, in, in this manner, uh, it transfers load from the radius to the ulna, and by the time the loads get to the elbow, the load on the loads on the coronoid and the loads on the radial head are basically equivalent. That's how the form works. But in order for that interosseous ligament to transfer the load, it has to create a transverse force because it's set at an angle. And that transverse force is now supported by the proximal and the distal radial ulnar joint. So we, let's look just at the proximal joint. If we don't have a radial head, there will be a force that tends to bring together the radius and the ulna causing problems. The same thing happens distally. We excise an ulnar a head, a distal ulna. Uh, it will be followed by problems in the young active patients. The same thing happens in the, in the proximal radius. That's why patients lose forearm uh, uh, force, forearm uh, rotational uh, force. And if we follow these patients down the line, you will see that there are changes between the radius and the uh, uh, all now uh, because impingement occurs here too. It's not often symptomatic, but it does occur. Now, one of the reasons that radial head implants fail is because they have a short stem and they're not stable to this lateral force. They were designed before uh, the we understood the biomechanics of the radial head. And bipolar implants tend to always collapse in this valgus alignment that is due to the same force. And that may, may in some cases, uh, produce um, impingement between the biceps tuberosity and the ulna. And we had to go to the lab and figure this out ourselves because not much was in the literature. So what we did is we mounted a cadaveric form in a vertical beam, attached it with screws, and then loaded the MTS machine on the lunate fossa and pushed as hard as we could with the machine. And then we measure, measure with a force transducer what was the lateral force. And it was quite interesting that it was very predictable and very, very linear. 
that force is about 20% of the force applied distally. So young people that can do easily 100 pounds of grip force, according to Putnam, can generate up to 500 pounds on their distal radius because we know that the, the body works against mechanical advantage. <clears throat> and these 20% of that 500 pounds is a very significant number. It is about 100 pounds uh, on the proximal radioma joint. Another aspect about the joint is its uh, uh, shape. And the normal radial head is aligned uh, to the axis of forearm rotation. The proximal surface is basically perpendicular to the axis of forearm rotation, but it is not perpendicular to the neck of the radius. And the neck of the radius is where we gain fixation usually. And our traditional implants are perpendicular to the stem, which means that they're around usually six degrees off. And as you pronate and supinate, if you're fixed on your neck, you're going to be generating this wobbling motion that uh, will offer a sharp uh, edge to the capitella and to the trochlea and produce capitellar erosion. And this is a non-aligned radial head that we had to revise uh, for another reason. And when we, are, we examine them, you can see the wobbling motion that occurs. So from all this uh, data and observations, we came up with a conclusion that an ideal radial head should have a long stem to resist the transverse force. It should be aligned to the axis of arm rotation to prevent capital capitellar wear, and it should be a monoblock to provide stability uh, and prevent uh, uh, <clears throat> dislocation after injuries such as a terrible try. So we align it to the axis of rotation and always looks kind of cockeyed. But what is cockeyed is not the radial head, it's the stem. And there's a mechanism that allows it to be fixed permanently in whatever alignment uh, was chosen. And after we have aligned it and locked it, then the rotation is now basically uh, uh, the same as physiologic. There's no uh, wobbling of our radial head. And that's all I have on the, uh, the uh, uh, ideas on radial head design and on mechanics of the radial head. And now Dr. Arisa is going to share his vast clinical experience with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orbe. Uh, let me just share my screen here. We'll continue to talk about the radial head and you know obviously getting into radial head arthroplasty but i wanted to first start off with kind of our decision matrix dr orbe did a really nice job of explaining to us the classification systems and the the a good classification system can help us make decisions as we move on um, through that classification system but sometimes they can be a little bit confusing so having a good surgical decision matrix um, is very important um, when you look at your radial head fractures, it really is important to isolate whether it's a clinically isolated fracture by itself with no other associated injuries or whether it has another operative injury. Your isolated injuries themselves, if they have a non-displaced radial head fracture, uh, certainly you can treat that non-operatively. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have them moving well within two weeks. Um, I don't routinely um, come down to the emergency department to do a hematoma um, aspiration and injection of uh, lidocaine unless I'm concerned for mechanical blocks to motion, uh, but certainly that's been something that's been described before that can help patients facilitate early range of motion uh, after injury. If you have a displaced fracture, um, but there's uh, less than 45 degrees of, of angulation um, when you're looking in both your pronation and supination views, you could certainly consider treating that as well. Uh, non-operatively with motion by two weeks. Um, close radiographic follow-up is very important. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is if you do have an, another operative injury, such as an associated montasia fracture or a variant, a terrible triad injury, um, 
maybe even a wrist injury like we saw, then more likely than not, you're going to be leaning towards doing surgery for that patient. In this regard, what we look at, again, is the type of radio head fracture. If you have small fragments, less than approximately 20% uh, of the radio head, and um, it's not an important part of the radio head, we're talking about just maybe some smaller little ossicles, then certainly you could consider excising those fragments. Um, if you have one to three repairable fragments, then you could consider ORIF. As far as repairable fragments are concerned, to me, what I have found that works best is I look to see whether or not there's communication between the radio head, the neck, and the shaft. If I have fragments that at least have some sort of continuous communication between the head, neck, and shaft, then that's more likely going to lead me towards wanting to fix those and, and feel like they can heal pretty predictably versus if there's no communication between the head, neck, and shaft at any point. Um, so certainly that can lead in that regard. Um, and then if you have a non-repairable or an unstable uh, radial head, then you certainly want to do a radial head arthroplasty. Uh, surgical techniques and pearls are very important. This is a paper written by, um, uh, by the skeletal uh, team, Dr. Hoxima, Dr. Orbe, and Mercer, and Dr. Gray and Rubio. And essentially what they looked at was the safe zone uh, of where you can put your plates and screws. I think screws are fairly easy to do, particularly because we have headless compression screws that we can bury underneath the uh, cartilage. But plate placement is very important to make sure that we don't iatrogenically impinge our ability to mobilize. Uh, and essentially what this study showed us was the um, the tuberosity view, right? If we're looking at our bicipital tuberosity um, and we are, uh, and it's in, in profile, essentially, our plate should sit directly opposite from it. Um, and we know that we're within the safe zone. So that can certainly help us um, to play, put our plates safely. Now, again, when I look at these fractures, I, I really, like we talk about type ones, more likely than not, you can treat uh, non-operatively. Uh, certainly, if they're pretty big displaced fragments, you can do uh, with surgery, but really your type twos, threes, and fours are what you're going to be considering an arthroplasty for. Type twos, uh, you know, I know routinely we would consider those as, as those that you would want to fix, but depends on where you have your articular impaction. If you have significant articular impaction, particularly on that lateral articulating surface that's going to play an important role for stability, that fracture won't do well uh, with fixation. Um, there's not a lot of cartilage that you can elevate here, and there's also a dish component to that proximal uh, radius uh, articular cartilage. So if your entire dish is impacted and, and submerged, then it might be hard for you to elevate that and to regain stability. And the, the other thing as well is metaphyseal comminution. If you're having to guess where to put the head to the shaft because there's a lot of comminution through the neck, then certainly that can lead towards a malreduction or maybe even positioning your plate uh, in the wrong position that can lead to impingement. So significant metaphyseal comminution is another indication for an arthroplasty. Uh, type threes, uh, three or more fragments, and certainly anything with dislocations uh, has been shown to have better outcomes uh, in the literature. So when we look at some of the papers that have led us in, towards thinking about arthroplasty, you look at this paper from uh, Dr. Ring and, and Jupiter, um, they looked at 56 patients, um, you know, treated with radio head fractures with ORIF. Now, this is one of our older patient uh, papers, but certainly cited quite often. The comminuted fractures, uh, 17 of those that were treated um, out of the 29 had unsatisfactory outcomes, uh, and most of these were terrible triads. So that helps us think about arthroplasty in this regard. When you look at this um, really, really good study that was um, kind of a perspective study as well, looking at radio head replacement and or open reduction internal fixation, uh, again, with unstable, multi-fragmented radio head fractures, at two-year follow-up, those that had ORIF, 65% uh, had excellent to good results, but 48% had complications, um, whereas your arthroplasty patients had, um, you know, 91% good to excellent results and only 14% complications. So it's not to say that doing an arthroplasty won't have associated complications, but certainly the likelihood of having a better outcome is greater with arthroplasty than with ORIF if we're looking at these multifragmented or unstable elbow fractures. Another a commonly cited paper, again, um, by Dr. Ring, um, looked at 39 patients with terrible triad injuries. Those that had uh, radio head replacement, 0% of them had late instability, um, whereas, you know, three out of these nine with the radio head or IF had late instability. So that's not insignificant. I know the numbers aren't great with only nine um, patients in this regard, but if you extrapolate that, uh, certainly late instability is something that could have been prevented had we had the arthroplasty.
Um, so why do we replace the knotty excise? As Dr. Orbe said, it's because of the forces um, loaded across the elbow joint. We wanna prevent that valgus instability and provide that longitudinal stability. Now, as far as arthroplasty is concerned, right? When we look at what an arthroplasty is, it's the surgical procedure to restore the function of a joint. And we shouldn't forget about that. It's not necessarily a replacement. We're doing an arthroplasty here. We want to restore the functional anatomy, or as I like to think about it, what happens when you have that anatomy in motion, right? So we want this monopolar uh, stable prosthesis. We want to make sure that it allows for early and relatively pain-free range of motion, and we want to minimize that wobbling motion. Um, I like these two videos that Dr. Orbe showed us side by side, because again, it shows us what the wobbling motion can do um, to the capitellum. <laughs> Uh, compared to the aligned uh, radial head, which you know minimizes that wobbling motion. So looking at cases specifically, here we have this 70-year-old uh, female patient of mine, and she presented uh, to the emergency department. We have this um, AP and lateral view, and that radial head, it, it's gone, right? It's displaced. Um, certainly, she might have had a moment of instability. Uh, she describes that she felt that her um, her elbow dislocated at the time of the injury, but when she came into the emergency department, she'd already been helped and someone pulling on her elbow reduced it. We can see we have some small little ossicle fragments with the coronoid as well. We think of this as a terrible triad injury. Um, we do our radio head arthroplasty just the way that Dr. Orbe showed us with our technique. We want to make sure that, again, when our patient is in both neutral supination and pronation, the center of the dish should line up with the center of the capitellum. This is how we properly size not only medial to lateral, but also um, when we're going into flexion and extension to make sure that we remain stable. Um, and then obviously getting kind of these views that show us that the head fits very nicely within that lesser sigmoid notch um, can also help to make sure that we're not overstuffing it. Um, the patient is, is treated with early and stable range of motion. We don't splint, we don't brace them. We start therapy at one week. Um, you can see how we did our uh, ligamentous um, repair there of our lateral structures, did not need to have any fixation in the coronoid. Um, and, you know, it's a stable elbow if you do a properly uh, sized implant. Um, and you can allow this patient to have early uh, range of motion uh, and, and really be unrestricted. One of the things that helps me in my hands to make sure that I have a stable uh, elbow range of motion is isolating my annular ligament repair apart from my LUCL repair. Um, if I feel like I'm having a lot of subluxation and I tighten up the annular ligament, that can help prevent uh, some of that subluxation that might make me be afraid of instability. Here she is six months out post-injury. She, she worked really, really hard with her therapy. Um, she was able to regain full flexion and extension, um, pronation, supination as well. This one's a little bit more uh, complicated in a higher level of injury. And, um, you know, same thing, radio head fractured, witness dislocation. Um, this was a laborer that fell um, at, his, at his job and um, came in with this high level injury. Um, and you know, when we took this patient to the operating room um, and we performed our radio head arthroplasty, um, I was really happy with, again, the, the stability that I was able to obtain um, you know, just with flexion and extension. But I could see intraoperatively that I did have this anterior medial facet fragment that was non-displaced, but it was a pretty significant uh, fracture fragment. And I felt in, in my hands that I wanted to protect that rather than to splint it or make a, a bigger exposure um, by simply placing an internal joint stabilizer. So by placing the internal joint stabilizer, that allowed me to you know, give this patient uh, early range of motion without fear of um, you know, that intermedial facet fragment um, displacing uh, and, and also, uh, you know, allowed me to protect my uh, ligamentous repair that we did here on him as well. I like this injury because this uh, video, because it shows us that you can see he has, he has his sutures in place. This is him at his one year, one week follow-up, pardon me. And by the time they show up at one week, if you're confident and comfortable with your repair, they really should have this much motion um, and, and, and really motivated patients um, that you feel comfortable and that you trust to start allowing early range of motion will show up to the office, you know, with this um, clinical picture and you know that they're going to do really, really well. Here's a, a lady in her 60s and she presented to the office with these x-rays. And again, um, you know, I'm looking at kind of this proximal ulnar fracture and it, immediately I know I got to get that out to length first. Once I get this out to length, then that can allow me to properly size my radio head prosthesis. <laughs> Um, 
The other thing I have to, I reminded myself of was this is instability, which I know is going to be treated well with arthroplasty. So I took the patient to the operating room. We got an anatomical reduction of the ulna. And in the process of doing that, these uh, fluoroscopic views, they were really tempting to me, right? Because I was like, the radio head is sitting very well within, um, within the radio capitellar space. Um, it almost indirectly reduced the proximal um, at margin of the radio head. And, and it, it, it could be tempting to want to fix that. But again, the studies have shown and evidence has shown that you really want to not fix these injuries. These were with an associated dislocation. You want to do your arthroplasty on these folks. Um, and by performing this arthroplasty, then I don't have to worry about limiting this patient's range of motion and perhaps not allowing her to do um, early range of motion and, and leading to stiffness that could delay some of her recovery. So again, fluoroscopically, I like these dynamic views because I show these to the patient when they come to the office and I tell them, look, you have a stable elbow. You can flex it all the way. You can extend it all the way. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be moving right now. And sometimes their therapist will also want to see this as well so that they can push them with their recovery. Uh, here we are at one year. Again, with the aligned radio head, we don't have to worry about any accelerated radio capitellar wear at all. Um, we didn't need a, an internal joint stabilizer in this regard because it was very stable once we got our own um, fracture out to length. And here she is. Uh, wonderful therapy that she did, that she received, and really, really hard work that she, that she, that she put in. And, and um, you can get an excellent uh, clinical outcome. Uh, this is a higher level of injury again, and you can see how my lower level injury uh, geriatric ladies, um, very rarely do I need to, you know, stabilize those uh, with more than just, you know, suture repair and radio head arthroplasty. Um, higher level uh, laborers, I'm leaning, I'm thinking more along the lines of internal joint stabilizer to uh, protect both my fracture repair, but also to allow for early range of motion. So, as with any of these fractures, we wanna take the, the proper sequence first. And even though that was a very comminuted ulnar, we take our time. I like to build this from the, um, from the inside out. So I'll use the distal ulna, uh, distal humerus, pardon me, uh, almost as a template to restore the articular cartilage. Um, and then I like to try to get these clinical cortical reads if I can from the dorsal side of the ulna. And you can see how just with a clamp and two well-placed K-wires, we're able to get an anatomic reduction of the uh, proximal ulna there. Now, again, uh, the temptation exists there. We've got this comminuted fracture fragment. There's some impaction of the radio head, but immediately, you know, one might think, oh, I could probably fix this here um, and, and not have to do an arthroplasty on this laborer. Um, but again, we remind ourselves what the literature shows and the literature shows is they don't do as well with, uh, with replacement in the setting of this of dislocation like they do with an arthroplasty. Another uh, thing that I like about this case is that it highlights that you don't necessarily need to go after those coronoid fracture fragments all of the time. I know this is a radio head talk, but again, um, you'll see these fractures with these associated injuries. As I found that I was reducing this small type one fragment and trying to reduce it back to the proximal ulna, it kept, because of the capsule that was attached to it, it kept making my distal humerus want to sublux anteriorly. So to give it additional stability without having to repa uh, repair that fragment, what I ended up doing was putting an internal joint stabilizer in that regard. So the minute that I let go of these couple of screws that were trying to capture that type one fragment, the elbow became stable again, which allowed me to then reduce it. Um, I was then able to properly size my prosthesis. Um, and you can see how we were able to get really, really good uh, range of motion uh, in a stable elbow um, you know, with our internal joint stabilizer and we didn't have to go chase that type one fragment. But and most importantly, with the radio head, uh, doing this uh, replacement uh, rather than uh, trying to fix it, you know, we feel comfortable comfortable letting this patient start to move things early. Same thing. He's at his one week follow up. I love taking the one week follow up pictures because uh, in videos because we want to see where they're at. So he's almost there. Uh, he needs to work a little bit more at this time on his flexion. But I'm really happy. High high energy injury. This is what he looks like at one week. Um, you know, we anticipate that he's going to make a full recovery. So in summary, regarding radio head fractures, uh, your type ones, like we talked about, your non-displaced, no mechanical blocks to motion, maybe the uh, minimal angulation, those can do really well with um, you know, functional rehabilitation, early range of motion. Type twos, threes, and fours, we really wanna do a functional arthroplasty. We wanna make sure that we are stable uh, in all planes of motion and that we don't cause any ac accelerated uh, capitellar wear. 
We want to think about this as anatomy in motion, which means we line them up to the forearm axis of rotation. Avoid overstuffing. Critically important. Uh, you know, I look at it before I look at it on X-ray. I I make sure that when I look at the that lesser sigmoid notch that it's that it's fitting right there and properly where the native native uh, radio head would fit. And then obviously, last but not least, always evaluate the wrist before and after ma ma management of this proximal radio injury. And with that, um, we'll turn it over to, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and you know, Dr. Orbe. Um, and then, you know, if, if we have any uh, questions or any, um, you know, from the audience or, or from yourself, Dr. Orbe, we can certainly um, take those now. <clears throat> Thanks, Edgar. That, that was an, an amazing presentation. Um, your your cases are spectacular. I not only love your cases, but I love the way you you um, um, document them and and those um, dynamic uh, fluoroscope that you take are just so beautiful. Thank well, thank you, you Doctor. I, I have a question for you, Doctor. Would you mind telling us? So, let's say that you have a young patient that does have a, a radial neck fracture um, and it's not terribly comminuted, but you can't quite just get the read. Uh, but this is something that you're um, leaning towards um, that you want to do a, a fixation with and likely with uh, one of our protein plates. What are some of the tips that you can share with me and with the rest of the audience of how do you get your alignment? How do you get that free floating head lined up to the neck in case you are going to fix it? That's a very good question, um, Edgar. I, I, I find that fixing radial heads is certainly, certainly not easy when they're a type 3. When it's a type 2, then fortunately, that's a very easy thing to do. Uh, the, the the Kaplan approach, the, the traditional Kaplan approach in which you incise longitudinally with the uh, axis of the forearm and... Uh, more or less uh, between the uh, the center of the extensor deuterium communis, that you can release all the anterior capsule, all the anterior origin of the of the um, epicondylar muscles, but mm -hmm. then that that uh, remaining uh, uh, muscle origin that is posterior becomes like an impediment to exposing the radius and fixing a type three very well. That's that's a, a a reality. For that reason, we we are doing an, a surgical approach that is ligament uh, sparing, but it is it is um, a hybrid between the Kaplan and the Coker. Let me explain myself. Uh, right. The 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 or, the um, approach has about an inch of length in a traditional Kaplan direction. Mm -hmm. and it divides the annular ligament. And as soon as we go distal to the head, we at the level of the neck, then we come down to the insertion of the anconeus in right. the same direction as, as the Kaplan does, but we are way more distal to the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So as we reflect that mm -hmm. flap of tissue down that it has lateral uh, collateral ligament and part of the annular ligament down, you can preserve it beautifully, but then you have your whole radius in front of you because to apply the plate, you need about an inch, an inch and a half distal to the fracture. Now th mm -hmm. those, the it's very important that you do not have uh, an excessive amount of comminution at the level of the neck, because if you cannot fit them together, right. the odds of them healing uh, are low. You can always bone graft them and you have a very, readily available source of bone graft on the lateral uh, humeral column. So consider mm -hmm. doing that every time you have to. But still, I'd like to go with an open mind. I try to fix as many mm -hmm. uh, radial head fractures in young people as I can. But there are times that you have to just say, this is not going to work. I'll do a radial head replacement. When you are able to fix them, You've done the best you can for your patients. Those patients will um, have a functional radial head. You won't have to worry about it ever becoming a, a, a problem and having to need a second operation. But you have to get them to heal right. For sure. You know, I saw a patient in the office a couple of days ago. Um, he's 
18 years old and he had a, a blast injury through his elbow. And, um, you know, there were uh, probably, oh my goodness, maybe between three to four fragments that I thought were large enough through his radio head that I was like, man, he's 18. I, I really want to fix this. And, and I fixed it. And he has, um, he's got some clicking. And, and when I look at his films, you know, he's got just a tiny little bit of, you know, fragmentation through, through the head. Um, but, you know, it hasn't died. It hasn't necrosed. He's got full, uh, flexion, extension, pronation, and supination. I can just feel kind of just like a little tiny little mechanical clicking when he supinates almost like, um, like I can feel his radio hit, but he's got no pain. And, and the thing healed with just a tiny little bit of collapse. Um, and, and like I said, he's got full range of motion. So in that regard, I, you know, I did have to catch myself and I was like, I'm going to try to do this Herculean act, you know, effort to try to fix it. And I suppose if it doesn't heal, I could always do an arthroplasty, but any tips on, on these young patients, how do you really just tell yourself, look, he's 18, he's 20. It, it's, it's just in his hand. It's the best thing for him to have the arthroplasty and, and instead of me trying to fix this. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. And, and I don't have a definite answer. I do my best to, yeah. to fix them. Mm -hmm. uh, I always thought that if, if I fix him and, and they fail, as long as the elbow is stable, doesn't dislocate, mm -hmm. I can always go back and, and, and do something else. Mm -hmm. um, in the old days, before we had the internal drain stabilizer and, and we, we had less uh, uh, adequate instrument uh, fixation uh, instruments for the radial head, right. I remember I had about a 50%, <laughs> which is what the literature says, collapse and failure with this radial head. Mm. But it, they were not a total disaster. They would end up losing significant yeah. amount of extension they mm -hmm. lost forearm rotation and then i would go back once the once i th i thought the maximum healing had occurred and remove the hardware and many times the you had some some tissue that had healed and provides better than no radial head at all in some cases but in some in other cases it was really uh, not right but the 50 percent that healed were fantastic those patients were um, very well the worst you had to do is remove the hardware because those prominent plates from the old days mm -hmm. would irritate the um, annular ligaments, so they pronate and supinate, and you could feel them click, and, right. and they would sometimes complain about it. Mm -hmm. But now the I think the results with the radial heads are much better. Uh, and now our radial head replacements, they most of them get almost full extension and not full extension in the young patients. Right. 20 years ago, I never saw full extension with any radial head replacement because they were much more symptomatic. They just did not do as well as, as they're doing now. Right. Things have changed. And I, I believe our current radial heads are uh, certainly a step forward. I don't think that evolution has stopped. I mean, there will be ways to keep on improving them. No, that's uh, definitely. Dr. Vera um, very kindly wrote us uh, a question that he has here. Um, can you explain the therapy one week out from a terrible triad without an internal joint stabilizer? Are you doing supine overhead, avoid push off for six weeks, avoid terminal supination for four weeks, in general, stable intra op with gentle stress? So, yeah, what, um, you know, I, I used to not start therapy at one week until I, I actually, um, you know, saw a couple of your talks, Dr. Orbe, and, and I know that you have the therapist with you in your office, but in general, can you talk about if and when you start therapy and what are some of your restrictions uh, for the patients? Yeah, I, I think starting therapy around a week after surgery is, is very, uh, it's a very good thing to do. The earlier you move them, I think the, be the better they do. Mm -hmm. The uh, one week for soft tissue healing is, is perfectly fine. Uh, my first step in rehabilitation is, is to actually make sure that the, the wounds heal well and that the, uh, they don't have any, any, any um, uh, issues with that. I do give my patients steroids. I, I think that helps very much bring the swelling down. Uh, steroids uh, not only in, uh, improve the swelling at the elbow, yeah. but they also improve hand function. So the, the elbow is connected to the hand and a yeah. bad elbow injury can result in uh, CRPS, a stiff hand, and loss of function in other parts of the upper extremity, including the shoulder. 
So that we must always be watching out for shoulder and hand function on day one. Now, my patients come uh, a week after surgery with a big post of bulky dressing. I take it off and set my, my therapist meets them at that time mm -hmm. and builds for them a splint, a 90 degree uh, mm -hmm. elbow splint, long arm splint. Yeah. And the idea is that they use it for protection and for yeah. comfort. But they take it off to start movement. They, they will come to my therapist maybe three times a week or maybe more if necessary. Mm -hmm. And they will they they should take it off at home, not only to shower, but to perform range of motion exercises. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep them in that splint for the first month. I think it's just a way to remind them you were just operated. Be, yeah. Make sure you don't do anything too crazy. And after that first month, I start weaning them from the splint. That's that's more or less how, how, how we do it. Every patient is different. You yeah. will find some that really get stiff. They lose mm -hmm. a lot of elbow uh, motion. Uh, the, at the beginning, we concentrate on getting flexion. And as, as soon as we have satisfactory flexion, we really work hard on getting the extension. The extension is truly the more difficult thing to do, mm -hmm. but flexion is the, the most important thing <clears throat> for functional uh, reasons. Uh, our therapist makes uh, adjustable splints. So if they are losing, if they don't have uh, uh, recovered uh, sufficient extension, mm -hmm. they will make splints for them that some are uh, static and, and they will modify them in, as, as they come to visit to be used at night only. We don't want them to stop using uh, their elbow actively. We're talking now after the first month, between the, the first and the third month is when the fractures are on the way to healing, the, the uh, soft tissues have healed uh, properly, but the patients are stiff. That's a very important moment uh, to get them uh, to where they should go. No, that's great. Let's Thank see. you for that. Um, one question to follow up on that. Can you give us, so which, uh, you're saying that you were doing steroids. Do you do like a steroid uh, dose pack? Is there a certain medication that you prescribe? What's What, what do you uh, prescribe for that? Um, uh, the easiest thing to do is to give them a medral dose pack. Uh, okay. For a regular size patient, yeah. I, will, I will give them as part of their post-operative uh, uh, medication, a medral dose pack. If, if okay. it's, especially the, the big bulky, uh, guys with big muscles, they seem to be the ones that do the worst with this. Mm -hmm. And I, I will give them a steroid, uh, uh, a medral dose, the dose back. A very heavy patient, you can give them a double medral mm -hmm. dose. Right? It's not a very high dose. Occasionally, it's somebody that really needs uh, higher levels of steroid. And that is down the line when, when they're really not doing well in rehabilitation. We might place them on prednisone. We can, we can give them 20 milligrams a day mm -hmm. for a while and then taper it down. Yep. Any, uh, any indications for either, um, you know, NSAIDs um, or any kind of radiation therapy for you um, to kind of prevent HO? What's uh, your thoughts on HO prophylaxis at the elbow? Yeah, radiation therapy, certainly for fresh injuries, is not a good idea because they, it, it inhibits fracture fixation that's, that has been shown in the literature. But uh, for for releases after heterotopic ossification, actually radiation does work very well. It's just something you have to discuss with the patient. If they're too paranoid about getting cancer later, then, then they prefer not to do it. And it's not necessary. Many times you do the release and you, you don't give them radiation. Uh, I give everybody at least uh, um, uh, uh, a non-steroid anti-inflammatory medication not necessarily indocin. Indocin is very difficult to tolerate and the patients don't really take them because they get a really upset stomach, but we can give them meloxicam, which is one tablet once a day. I don't think there has been a lot of literature in different types of non-steroidals, but I assume they all work pretty much the same. So I do give um, meloxicam and I do give ibuprofen to, to my patients uh, during rehabilitation. No, that's, that's great. Um, you know, just to kind of, to give you my, my take on what Dr. Vera asked. So I definitely, um, you know, I want them to start therapy, um, at, at one week with a formal therapist, I want them to be moving, um, with passive, passive assisted therapy on their own supine overhead activities are great. The only thing that I restrict from them to try to give them, to try to get them to understand abduction precautions, right. To protect 
my ligament repair is I just essentially tell them, you know, what's in front of you, you can do, and that's safe. Anything where you have to, you would have to turn your head to see where your hand is going, that's dangerous. And so if you can see where your hand is going, you're likely safe with the position of the elbow. But if you cannot see your hand without having to turn your head, that's a position you don't want to be in. That's a position of instability. So in front is safe, in front is home. Um, certainly push off, avoiding it for about six weeks. I think that's very reasonable. Terminal supination, um, you know, for me, uh, I, I think if anything, I'm having difficulty getting them to supinate. And, and like I said, um, I have them, you know, almost kind of go into that prayer post and really try to push themselves to, to regain some of that prono supination. Um, but yeah, more than anything, as long as they stay in front of where they need to be, then it's a safe position and, and they can move early and often. Um, I'm looking at the and clock. Edgar, the, the, mm -hmm. the anti-gravity exercises. Those um, are great, uh, particularly for those the, are I, I enjoy, I tell them to do them, you know, laying supine and start doing anti-gravity is, is great for uh, just in general building strength, right? Not just range of motion, but, but having that um, strength return, which can be quite a bit of, of, of the weakness that can occur after, after these injuries. Good. Well, it's, it's already a, a little bit over the hour. So I really thank everybody uh, for uh, being with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Edgar. It, your contribution was essential for the success of this webinar. And thanks, Jose and, uh, and, and Nathan Hoxima, who um, was un, unable to uh, participate because he uh, was caught in an airport and a change of flight, but he had all the intentions with being, of being with us today. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Ray.